Welcome to another episode of Investing in Intellectual Property with Dave. Today, we have a very special guest with us. This gentleman has invented a bug catching device that helps you catch bugs and remove them from your home without having to get close to the bug. It has also caught the eye of Mark Cuban on a hit show, Shark Tank. Please help me, please help me welcome Justin Huang. How's it going, Jen? Hey, <laughs> Thank you for having me on the podcast. No, definitely, definitely. And I appreciate you giving me some time here to really go through your uh, story. It, it, it's a pretty interesting, especially as I was kind of doing, you know, some background information and prep, uh, preparing for this interview. Can you maybe explain for the audience first before we actually get off into things, your product, the actual, the, 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 the bud catching device? Can you uh, explain? I'm not even sure if you have one with you, but to the extent that you have one aside, that, that's even even better. But can you kind of take, take us through things just so the audience can understand uh, what you have. If they're watching this on YouTube or whatnot, they'll see a visual with a bug catching device you're holding, but uh, otherwise, uh, yeah. careful when you're about. Uh, definitely. So uh, yeah, this is the cup of bug. It's, it's a little bit hard to get this totally in the frame, but it's a, um, a device that's designed to look like, or to, to use like a cup and a paper method. So like normally when you see a bug, you might take a cup and, you know, slide the paper over it. Um, but for me, I kind of had this idea of like, what if we made something that was a little bit more useful, like from a distance, uh, and it's kind of like, uh, um, kind of a fun, like almost kind of comical, um, invention, but I mean, it has a practical side too, for people who are afraid of bugs, um, like I am, um, though, you know, to be honest, having a couple of bug around me has helped me a lot with my arachnophobia and um, help me uh, feel a little more confident when I see a little critter in my home. So yeah, it's, it serves kind of a dual purpose. So nice, nice, nice. And I, I, I was yeah. ask you, cause I think I was looking on the website and I saw a, an older iteration of uh, the device. Can you, how many iterations did you go through to get to the point where uh, you got to the version that you're selling now? Oh, you know, I lost count. Um, the whole process was like, probably a good three years on and off wow. uh yeah because uh you know I, as kind of an inventor i kind of like jump around to different projects yeah, here and yeah. covid happened so i had kind of had some ideas on like making um uh what is it personal um protection um devices oh, yeah, PPE, but, uh, ppe yeah that's what i meant yeah ppe uh but like i kind of jumped back and forth and and saw this old project, Cup of Bug, and I was like, you know what, I should really finish that. Um, so I had, yeah, you probably saw, when they, I kind of have my old, the, one of my old devices here. This is all 3D printed. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, it looks, it has, oops, sorry, hard to get a brain. It has yeah. some similarity to, similarities to the old one, or to the new one, but I pretty much completely redesigned it. If, all in all, probably at least 100 different iteration or, wow yeah and, and did you 3d print every iteration or did you say one iteration may have uh, or one, one once you 3d printed say one prototype it may have had you know two or three iterations embodied within it i would say more so um the latter yeah really? sometimes okay. yeah i would i would try to well you know cup of bug is is um a, a somewhat complicated product so you know there's different sections to it there's like the where the cup is and then there's like other systems like the the handle yep. so you know you kind of work in tandem and you combine those those two different systems together so you'll be working on like iteration like 10 or 12 of the handle and like 50 on the cup or something like that yeah uh well, but yeah pretty much 3d printed most of those iterations yeah right and so i was going to say just kind of going back to the explanation or the description of how it works <clears throat> you said that you were trying to kind of really capture a situation where typically you see a bug in your home and typically if you don't want to squash the bug, whatever the case may be, you'll put some type of cup or uh, whatever over the bug to kind of try to trap it, if you will. So I saw mm -hmm. when you had the the latest version, uh, 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 latest version that you're selling, you still have that kind of cup, mechan uh, cup of mechanism, but then you have, it seems like a platform where when you uh, actuate the handle, it kind of open so that the bug can kind of get trapped within uh well i guess within a cut portion if there is that is, does, is, does that sound about right 
No, yeah, that's a, a perfect description of it. It's yeah, it's essentially like you have the cup and then there's this lid and it's gotcha. actuated by this thin string and that string is connected to the handle. So yeah. when you pull on it, it just goes in and slides it closed. Yeah. Nice. So, nice. Nice. And then there's a there's a sorry, I'm having a hard time with the camera cuz it's inverted. Uh, but there's like a sp uh, torsion spring on this yeah. side. Uh, hopes that you're a mechanical engineer. Uh, yeah, you got the torsion spring on this side, so it just applies like leverage to the um, to that lid, and uh, yeah, that's the main thing. And then the other kind of like big aspect of cup of bite is this um, uh, kind of a, like a universal joint mechanism that's what it that allows you to you know place the cup at an angle and it kind of stays there. Yeah, um, so good for walls. And like ceilings and on the floor, um, and then it can also kind of tilt this way, so it can um, make sure you the cup lies flat against that surface, yeah. even if you're not off on the angle. Yeah. Well, yeah, and I was going to say, it seems like uh, that kind of being able to pivot and having that universal joint really allows you to not only catch a critters on the floor, but if they're on the walls or on the ceilings, it, it also allows for you to uh, kind of catch critters on, which was cool. I, I guess I want to maybe you talked a little bit about the inspiration of the product. One being that you uh, really don't like bugs. Can you kind of maybe take us through kind of just the inspiration? Uh, I think I was reading. I'm not sure if it was on your website or not, where you talked about as a child, always kind of choosing the, the flight response when uh, confronted with a bug. Uh, can you kind of maybe, because this is pretty cool. And this is something that I do want the audience to really understand that a lot of times, these inventions, they're coming from kind of real life uh, situations, real life problems. And you all as inventors providing solutions to the real life, uh, real life situation. Now, it doesn't have to be as uh, in depth from the standpoint of in your situation where you are actually kind of producing the 3D models or the yeah, uh, 3D printing the, the actual products or prototypes for each one of these things. But ultimately, this stuff stems from a problem that you as an inventor is you know, kind of really going through and uh, just not just sitting by the wayside and not doing anything, but saying, okay, putting pen and paper and saying, hey, I'm going to kind of have, put this idea on paper and then actually create a prototype, which again, I always think is amazing when you can take something in your head and create an actual device that people wants to buy. It's like, you're talking about just kind of being a, having a proud moment. That's cool. But again, can you go back to like the inspiration and kind of how that all started for the uh, couple bug device? Sure. Definitely. Um, I think, uh, yeah, yeah. Growing up, I was always scared of bugs, especially spiders. Uh, I was just like the way they move; like it just, you know, gives me the creeps a little bit. And then um, I think, uh, like as a child, I would always just kill them, and that <laughs> that like instinct, right? Like kind of carried on into adulthood. But then I started like feeling bad because you know bugs. Uh, you know, they'll try to run away from you. And I just realized that maybe I should try to like, um, be a little more mature, I guess, about how I deal with it and, and realize that like, logically, like, it doesn't make sense for me to kill them because they are innocent. So um, I don't know, I just kind of had this, like, this moment of, I guess, self-reflection. And I was like, all right, I'm going to change my ways. Um, <laughs> and, uh, I tried to use the cup, like just a normal cup and just put it over it. But oh my gosh, David, like some of those bugs are just so like, like, I don't know. I just couldn't, I couldn't get myself to really do it. Um, so then I was like, you know what? What if there is like a device for catching them? And it turns out that there are devices. This is another important thing I think in this story is that there's a lot of times when you're like, you got an idea and you're oh yeah, I'm so excited. And then you realize that someone has already invented something, right? And it kind of puts cold water on your, you know, story or your like drive. But at the same time, you can always just iterate and become you know, your own version of it. And, um, you know, this, devices like this have existed for a long time. I saw a patent from like the 1920s on a bug catching. And, um, um, but I just was like, why has no one just done the most obvious thing of just making a cup and just sliding a lid over it, just emulating exactly like yeah. a mechanical version of just that normal response. Right. Um, and I was like, all right, I'm going to set out to do it. 
Uh, turns out it's it's not that easy to <laughs> accomplish, but I mean, um, yeah, we got it done. And um, yeah, another part of it is that like Cup of Blood kind of has this style to it that's like kind of cutesy and like kind of retro, but also kind of like weird and like modern at the same time. So like I tried to like make everything like not just the design but the name is kind of cute and like the website is kind of cute you know so this all ties into intellectual property too right uh, right and, well, and, uh, and, yeah and, and i was going to say uh and i definitely want to kind of get more in, off into the uh, weeds of the whole intellectual property here in just a second but to kind of piggybacking off of your point a lot of times you know as an attorney i noticed as a pan attorney but typically people are not inventing groundbreaking stuff this stuff is a lot of times incremental improvements over kind of what's out there. Going to your point, hey, bugs have been around forever. So it's not like, okay, I invented the first bug catching device. That typically is not how that works. It's very few times that you're just kind of revolutionizing or creating an industry that kind of wasn't existed uh, that, or that didn't exist before. Typically, a lot of time, your invention is an incremental, incremental improvement over what was out there before. So, again, I think that's a great point as far as just future inventors, people who have ideas that may see it out there, do not get, uh, I guess, bogged down or uh, dissuaded because you maybe see something out there that's similar. That's typically how that goes. Your invention is probably going to be an incremental improvement over what's out there. And, again, you can still sell a ton of these things and make a nice amount of money with your incremental improvement, especially if it's serving a need or serving a, uh, a final solution to a problem. I'm actually uh, helping out one uh, young lady who's kind of going through the process and, and she has a device and, you know, she, I told her, I'm kind of t taking her through the steps of, you know, filing uh, or doing a panability search and all that stuff. And she came back with something that was, you know, it was in the realm of what it is that she's doing. And I'm like, hey, yeah, that's just kind of part of how that goes. Uh, now it mm -hmm. comes the point of you having to define or differentiate your product from what you found. And uh, that's where kind of the inventing kind of really starts, uh, so to speak. So, yeah, d definitely don't get bogged down as audience. If you're kind of have an idea, but you see something out there that's similar, that's just kind of how things go. Uh, and again, a lot of times your product is an incremental improvement over what's out there. And it is a ton of stuff out there. So, uh, yeah, I thought that was a good point that you had brought up, Justin. So I guess going back to uh, I know you kind of talked about when you were inventing this and going through the different iterations and prototypes that you were jumping around between different products, what, like, what was like, like before the, the cup of bug or the, the, I guess the bug catching device. So uh, it seems like you have some type of engineering or design background. Uh, can you maybe kind of expound on that a little more as far as what you were doing before inventing this particular device? Yeah, definitely. Um, so, uh, my, my company, um, my company named Solid Factory and Cup of Bug is a product within Solid Factory. Gotcha. Uh, but uh, yeah, you know, it, it kind of follows a similar story of Cup of Bug. It comes from like a personal need that I have uh, and like my own interests. So um, I started off with making some accessories for board games, um, board game players, okay. uh, because I... I love playing board games with my friends. And um, I was like, you know what? I, I want to create like a little dice tower roller. Uh, I wish I had one over here, but that was my first ever product. Um, I didn't get it patented because I was just like, you know what? No one's going to copy me on this one. And um, yeah, that's, that's uh, pretty much held true. <laughs> and, um, but, you so know, nobody, you nobody ended up uh, copying you off that particular product or game? Um, nah, yeah. People, people... You know, um, I think for, for certain projects that are like so niche, um, people yeah. won't copy it. Or that even if they do, you know, they're going to make like a incremental improvement and, you know, it's fine. But um, what is it? And then I had like some other some other products. I kind of uh, I kind of did a little bit of a, a possible gray area thing in the past where like I had. Uh, have you heard of the game Settlers of Catan? I haven't. Oh, okay, so it's like um, it's a it's a popular board game. It's like a newer one though uh, from the '90s, and uh, I, I created like these little organizers for them. And I used to like 3D print out the name Catan, and okay. that was trademarked, so that was definitely a no-no. And like I got kind of like busted by the uh, publisher <laughs> of that game. So that was my first foray into intellectual property and what you're not supposed to do. 
Uh, so I had to change the name of that product. Uh, but yeah, that was, uh, um, you know, that was kind of like my first like, oh, okay, wow, I really do have to follow the rules. It's not just like the Wild West. Out yeah, here. yeah, free for all. Yeah, whatever you want. yeah, exactly. So I was like, all right, we got to kind of like, you know, control ourselves here. Mm -hmm. And like also like taking pictures of products for like accessories for other games. Like you can't use like that copyrighted image of yeah. on the cards itself. So, yeah. okay, well, we're learning. Seems like, man, you're stumbling on all into the uh, things that you not, are not supposed to do from an IP perspective. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've definitely gotten close to getting banned uh, on Amazon a few times. So, um, you know, the, the, uh, yeah, there's ways to kind of like um, uh, click, get close to the edge of the fire, so to speak. Yeah. Um, and I've definitely done that. Uh, but for a couple of bucks, by that time, like after having created maybe like 10 or 15 different products, I guess, um, I started Cup of Bug and, um, I realized that, you know, what, we're going to try to go the totally legit way and, uh, get a patent attorney pretty early on in the project. Nice. And I want to hear think. that. So definitely, uh, if you got a good idea, I think, and you want to like, you know, make sure that it has like a solid future, like safe future. Like I think getting a patent attorney to, or like, you know, someone that knows trademarks and copyright well, um, will be able to guide you. Definitely. Yeah. Well, absolutely. And, uh, I guess maybe kind of going back a little bit with the older products where you, did you make a, a lot of money or did you make money selling those products before kind of moving on to the cup of bug or were those just kind of hobbies that you were doing and maybe kind of not really treating it as a business because it seems like okay you have a company you have a number of different things within a company that you're selling products and stuff like that uh, so were those other products successful at least from a monetary standpoint or they were you, you weren't really treating it as a business at that point for it to kind of maximize the opportunity for you know for making money yeah uh definitely yeah i'm a i'm a pretty like risk averse person a lot of times um so i was i was definitely kind of treating it as like a side gig for a while okay. um and then after after a year or so of selling i realized that it was actually doing pretty good um and i was like all right well i really enjoy making products and and selling them on like you know my Etsy store, or Amazon yeah. store. So I decided to pursue it full time. Um, and then, uh, what is it called? I, uh, uh, oh, I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> well, no, 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 no worries. No, so yeah, I guess. Yeah. So, so I guess with the cup of bug, now your your decision, and before, because I, I, I don't, I want to, I don't want to skip this before we get into the IP side of things. You ultimately decided. And we'll talk about the Shark Tank experience in a little bit, but you decided to go to Kickstarter route. Was that Kickstarter route? You said you're not really an adverse person or you're an adverse uh, person, a risk averse person. So it was a Kickstarter mm -hmm. route to kind of prove out the idea before you start just kind of making these things in book. Was that kind of part of the the reason to go to Kickstarter route? Uh, yeah, you nailed it, David. Um, yeah, I, uh, you know, after having made so many products that totally flopped in the past, some of them have, oh, yeah. You, you asked me if they had done well. Yeah, some of the products have actually done well. Okay. And, you know, I was making, like, a decent living. Like, uh, entrepreneurs, on average, I think they they do, like, maybe $70,000, like, in terms of, like, their salary or something. Okay. I was approaching okay. that, I guess. So um, is this, this is just with your product. You're not working at another company. This is just based on the products that you're selling for your company that you start. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's, that's, um, that's legit. Yeah, I mean, it, it comes and goes, though, like, because, you know, if you depending on your product, like if it's kind of a trendy thing, and it like, does well, like for for what one example, uh, another intellectual property point as well is uh, uh, there was a game like Pokemon Go, I came out, and I created a little planter um, for it. And other people were doing the same thing. And like the biggest, um, like kind of third party seller of these planters. Uh, actually got like in trouble with Nintendo or mm -hmm. Pokemon company. So, you know, I was kind of trying to like fly underneath the radar again. Uh, <laughs> I had to learn my lesson at the time. Uh, but yeah, that so like, but in terms of sales, like that one just speak, uh, like spiked like crazy. And then it kind of, you know, dwindled off after, over time. 
but that's kind of how it goes sometimes. Um, and those are good too. So there's like kind of that like trend thing. And then there's like the long tail products that continue to sell regardless of the trends. Yeah, um, it makes sense. And again, um, I, I yeah. guess it, it kind of before you finish that thought, uh, mm -hmm. I mean, that, that's again, to the audience again, that's not surprising where if you have something that just catches fire and selling a ton, I always say that's when you know you're successful or you're approaching that success mark when people are starting to copy your product. Cause they're not going to copy something that's not doing good. That's not making money. That's not selling. So to the extent that your product or your device is selling and, and, and you get copycatters, that means you're kind of approaching that I have made it mark. Cause people don't want to copy something kind of going back to your board games. Like, okay, I don't want to copy something if it's not selling. I'm just going to copy something. Uh, if it is selling, obviously that's the easy way out and not the right thing to do because you are committing, whether it's copyright infringement or patent infringement or whatever the case may be. But that's just kind of the nature of the game, unfortunately. So I guess if you don't want to have copycats, this is probably the wrong game for you. But to the extent that you have an ideal and you want to start a business based on your idea, you're going to get copycats at some point if you are selling. That's just kind of the way things go. So it will be better to kind of prepare for that now mentally as opposed to get into the situation and get bogged down or uh, just kind of get overwhelmed as a result of, oh, somebody's copying them, copying my product. What I'm going to do now, I'm going out of business. It's kind of part of the game, unfortunately. Yeah, um, it is. And, you know, there's two ways to look at it, like kind of the positive way. And I, I try to look at a positive too, because it's kind of a badge of honor, honestly. Yeah, for sure, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and it, it does kind of prove out your concept as well. It's like, People, people also see the value of it and are willing to make the effort to totally try to copy you. Like, honestly, um, yeah, it's bad if they undercut you and everything. But um, in terms of uh, uh, getting sales, um, yeah, I've had, uh, you know, I, I met a few friends actually in Shark Tank and they're going through that exact problem where they have a product and uh, it was getting, uh, they they manufactured it in the U.S., but then a company in China like totally ripped their design, even ripped their name, um, and we're just selling it on Amazon for like half the price. Um, so it is it is a legal battle, um, definitely. And uh, thankfully, I think I think you know if you just give it enough effort, you can kind of squash the the copycats that pop up. But it is a long battle. No, yeah, for sure. I interviewed the inventor Wayne from of the selfie stick and uh man, he, he was at a trade show trade show in China where he saw a booth of a company selling the selfie, his essentially his product, and he went up to the guy and kind of played dumb, like, oh, this is pretty cool. Who invented this? And the guy is like, I did. Like and then kind of Wayne confronted him on it, like, no, you didn't invent it. I invented it, and you actually are copying it. And they interestingly enough end up Working together, they seemed like the guy was a manufacturer, and he ended up kind of manufacturing a product uh, in China to you know for Wayne to be sold across the world. So, man, I, again, it just I guess it is what it is. But I guess another thing that you have pointed out on Amazon, Amazon has kind of came a long way, especially with their Apex program. So if you have a utility patent on something, uh, you can get a copycat taken down pretty quickly and inexpensively if you show that you have a, a you know an active patent on the device which i think is pretty cool i'm not sure if you had the experience kind of going through that process yet but again for inventors who want to take advantage of the platform amazon to reach this massive audience you know i just think the apex program is another way to help protect your invention without having to spend a lot of time and resources and our money in court uh, with you know different infringers just you know just being able to show your patent to amazon and say hey this is my patent i have a legitimate patent that you know that that's going to allow you to get those copycats taken down on Amazon. Now you may have to do that every so often, but again, I think that's a, a, a very good alternative to having to spend the money and the time that you will otherwise have to do in court. That's actually a really, I've never heard of that, David. So thanks for bringing that up, the Apex program. Yeah, and that sure. actually kind of fortifies like the value of a patent because yep. a lot of times people are like, I don't want to do a patent because then I have to like spend a lot of money to fight for it, you know, and, and keep that maintenance up. Um, uh, but yeah, there's a, uh, you know, I, I've experienced the side of it, like, where, like I got and taken down really quickly. Um, yeah. so it works. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. Absolutely. And again, people think that, uh, this stuff is, if you're not, if you don't want to protect your pet, I, I guess I get it or your idea. I guess I get it. Maybe you're in the wrong business, but to the extent that you will have something and you're willing to protect it, especially if it's making money, I think it's, mm -hmm. 
things out there, such as the Apex program, such as branding. I think that's another undervalued thing. Uh, and I think you have a trademark as well on Cover Bug, if I'm not mistaken. But again, you have the patent on the actual product, but then you have the brand Cover Bug, which even long after the patent expires, if you're selling this thing, if you still are you still selling this thing, you've created a brand to the point where people know this device from Cup of Bug or from what like just think of McDonald's. You drive down the street and you can have all these hamburger shops, but they're looking for the golden arches. A lot of people are looking for the golden arches because that kind of provides that that says something about the quality of product that they're getting or service that they're getting from this particular restaurant, from this particular brand. And I think people need to start looking at their businesses in the same way. Like, okay, yeah. You have the patent on actual product, but again, kind of continue to build that that brand up so that even after the patent expires or if you're coming up with other products, people not understand the quality that they're getting with that brand and understanding the service that they're getting with that brand. And they want to come back to that brand as opposed to go to a knockoff just because it's cheaper. It's like, no, I, I, mean, I, I know I know Apple is going to be, I'm going to get a, a good legitimate computer when I shop at Apple as opposed to some infringer that or some copycat that's going to sell the computer for a thousand bucks less but i've never heard of the name and i'm trying to kind of get a a, a cheap computer no I, I don't want a cheap computer i want a quality product that's going to last the test of time and kind of different things so i i think from a branding standpoint that can kind of help fortify like the business and kind of the products and kind of guard against copycats if that makes sense uh but no i, I guess going back to, to, to kickstarter so th- when you're doing this because i have a few other people who have started on kickstarter and it seems like that's a good way to kind of prove out the concept, prove out the method, prove out kind of what it is that you're trying to sell before kind of really jumping into it, uh, jumping into it feet first. So did you have a number that is like, okay, once I hit this number on Kickstarter, then I'm in business. I proven out the concept. It's a need for it. And I can actually start kind of really going into this thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Kickstarter. Um, well, I, you know, that was my first Kickstarter, so I didn't really know what I was doing exactly, but, um, there's like a lot of, yeah, like, uh, uh, a lot of people set their, their, their goal on Kickstarter to, I think like some amount, I, for me, I had just put it to the cost of the molds, like, yeah. and that's the biggest hurdle to get across, um, in terms of cost is just getting that initial manufacturing cost done. Um, I probably should have costed in like the cost of a batch run as well, yeah. but I just like, part of me, I really wanted to get that project done. So. I just kind of did the lower barrier of the two. So I just did the molds, uh, which was about $20,000 um, total. Um, there were about like five different molds um, that I needed to do for a couple of bug. Um, and then once we, re- we reached uh, $28,000, I think, on Kickstarter. Mm. Uh, so it was pretty good. Uh, how, how long did it take you to get to that $28,000? Because I, I, from my understanding, I have never used a Kickstarter, but they're saying that you you want to get that pretty early or and pretty quickly after, after you kind of launch your campaign as opposed to it kind of dragging on. Yeah, um, you can set the days to like either like down to I think like even like twenty or fifteen days. I did thirty days, okay. uh, which was recommended by Kickstarter. Um, but you know, I did not do it the 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 most like correct I guess meta way of um running a Kickstarter campaign. A lot of people create like a lot of hype beforehand they go to all these kind of um what is called blogs um you know that sell like that are related to that product um and they generate like an email list you know hype and then once they launch it just has this huge spike in sales for me i just kind of like threw it on there and let it like sit you know and then um but thankfully i think i had a lot of people on social media that just love the product so they bought it and um it really worked out. Yeah, getting getting on Kickstarter definitely did a lot of things that I did not um, I did not anticipate. Uh, for one, yeah, it proved out the the product uh, because if there's a big difference between people saying that they want to buy it and people actually putting the money. Right, down. right, right. Yeah, uh, learned that the hard way too with other products. Uh, but uh, that and then also um, it definitely creates a sense of like. Le- legitimacy that you're actually making into a real product um, and it's putting um, kind of that brand like reputation on the line so you have to like really stand behind it and then um, it also got me introduced on um, Shark Tank too like the person 
um they have like i guess like casting people that look around on like yeah. sites like kickstarter huh, uh, i did not know that yeah that helped me get on the uh shark tank uh so that's huge and then um and also gave me a, a base of like really loyal og customers too yeah. so that's but that's crazy. crazy that you essentially sold twenty eight thousand over the course of 30 days it seems like without any real like advertisement or kind of publication of the actual device is that correct yeah um i had another uh uh po podcast interview with okay. like a, a marketer yeah. and he was looking at the progression of the sales and he said that it was like very abnormal that that happened because normally you get that first spike but mine was just like a constant like basically yeah. one thousand dollars nice yeah. nice nice and then uh out of curiosity because you i guess a lot of people think of Okay, bugs and more of a kind of, okay, women hate bugs and men, they're kind of macho men and we're across the bugs and whatever the case may be. Did you notice any of that between like the amount of devices sold to women as opposed to men or is it kind of pretty even? Um, You know, I, I, I haven't done like any actual statistics on it, um, but just like kind of, um, I guess, anecdotally, like just looking through the orders and seeing like the number of names of like women versus men. Yeah, there does seem to be more women on there. Uh, I'm not going to lie. Uh, but, you know, we got a lot of men too. Um, no, for sure. For sure. Yeah, yeah that's cool. Uh, well, so possibly the men are buying it for their, uh, you know, daughters or or um, significant others or something. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's a fun, it's a fun project to... Yeah. No, for sure. So then I guess kind of before we get into the shark thing, shark tank uh, experience. So you talked about early on in this interview, how it's important to kind of seek out a fan attorney earlier on in a process and protect it. Uh, is that something that you always knew? It seems like you already, you had a lot of these products, some of which you decided to protect, some of which it seems like you didn't decide to protect, but it seems like no, notwithstanding that you had experience, albeit maybe being on the other side of things uh, from an infringer or maybe a potential infringer standpoint of kind of people coming at you for violating their IP or infringing their IP. So was that always something in the back of your head? Like, Hey, I need to protect this thing sooner rather than later. Or did, you know, someone, a family member or a friend say, Hey man, you need to protect this thing. Oh, by the way, I got this list of pan attorneys that you can call to try to help you protect it. Um, yeah. I think the, the moment where I realized I need to protect it is when I, I to also prove the concept, I posted a video on TikTok and it was a prototype. Like it was so it was so bad, David. It was like there's like duct tape like keeping everything together yeah. and it was like the shoddiest video you ever seen. Uh but it got it went really viral, hit like twelve million views or something. Wow. Wow. Yeah. And like so many people were like, You need to patent this and stuff like that. And like of course, to get like comments from your family, like, oh, yeah, you need to patent this. And you're like, okay, yeah, you guys are just being too nice. But I think when like strangers on like the internet are telling you to patent it, that might be a good sign. Yeah. Um, and I didn't know it at the time, but there's kind of like a window of opportunity to patent, um, which happens like you can't patent after you've totally shown like the device to the world already, no. you know? And, and, I, and I was going to say, that, that's probably one of the things that you just said that I just kind of shake my head as a pan attorney. So yeah. in the U.S., they do give you a grace period. So, for example, mm -hmm. once you showed that device on, what you said, TikTok? Yeah, TikTok. You do get a year grace period for you to be able to file the application. Because mm -hmm. they call that that's what it's called a public disclosure. Once you publicly disclose your invention, and that can be public, public disclosure through you know, telling someone, it can be a public disclosure through uh, showing the device, on TikTok or social social media platform or through kind of literature, that starts your one year grace period. And in the U.S., you got a year to file the application before you're barred from filing it in the U.S. However, some countries such as Europe and other countries uh, throughout the world, you cannot file your uh, a pen or a pen application on your invention after you public dis publicly disclose it. So in other words, that public disclosure acts as an absolute bar. China, I think, is another country where Again, once you publicly disclose it, then you cannot file a patent application within that country. So, again, the U.S. Yeah. gives you a year grace period. However, some countries, they don't give you that year grace period. That's why we always say file the application first. You can file a provisional. It's a couple hundred dollars. Just, you know, it can be pictures of things and 
whatnot, and you can follow that. It doesn't have to be any kind of pretty formal requirements that the null provision has to be in, but at least that gets your, your uh, data in line before you start showing this thing in. You get a year to convert it from that provisional to a non provisional. So I guess that will be my kind of two cents to what you said there. But yeah, I definitely wouldn't recommend people just showing it without at least having a provisional application on file. You can get away with it in the U.S., uh, but mm -hmm. some countries, they, they don't give you that grace period and that public disclosure will act as an absolute bar to uh, you filing a patent application within that country. Yeah, uh, so I got really lucky with that. Um, you know, Dave, we're learning things the hard way out here. Sure. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's why... Look, that's why uh, that, that's why the podcast. I'm trying to I'm trying to get the people before they just start showing this thing before they start. Because again, that 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 can be a big thing. Uh, I'm not gonna say who the person name is, but I mean, it, it, you know, they wanted to file a patent application that they are filed that they filed in the U.S., but they wanted to file it overseas because they thought the product was gonna do well in Europe. And unfortunately, they uh they they missed the filing date. So a lot of times with this stuff, this this dates in place that you have to file the application by or else you're pretty much screwed. So I'm trying to kind of give you guys that information so that you don't uh, kind of miss an opportunity as it relates to kind of not, cause this is something that I'm pretty sure you didn't think about. Like I'm just showing this thing on TikTok. You don't think of on a back end, well, how can this affect you from a patentability standpoint? And I guess that's kind of where I come in as a patent attorney, as an IP attorney to try to kind of make you all aware of these dates so that you guys don't kind of miss what can be a, a life changing opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, definitely. Uh, I learned from that one. Um, so, you know, so, some things, you know, you, as an entrepreneur, I think you have to kind of um, do kind of an assessment. Like, do you think that this is going to be worth patenting or yeah. not? You know, and if it is, that provisional could really save you. That's kind of like sure. that, that nice, like kind of pillow that you could do that doesn't cost that much. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I think it's, I think from now on, I'll probably like, if I have a big idea, then I will do a provisional for sure. And like for sure. I also um, have an added value as well. Like I've watched a lot of Shark Tank, and a lot of times the sharks are like, "Do you have a patent on this?" And if they do, it adds value to their overall um, business, right? Like, yeah. um, so. No, and, uh, I, and not only that, I think uh, I had interviewed Lisa Lloyd, which she man, she's phenomenal. She has uh, that interview comes out I think next week, but she has eight products. She was actually, this, 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 how old, much of an OG she is. She was on season one of Shark Tank. Oh, wow. And, Wait, and she did a deal uh... with, she did a deal oh, with yeah. Damon John. It was on a TC chest, which is a pretty much a chest with some compartments in it. But she also had seven other products that was kind of in the hair industry that she licensed out. And she was saying how they give you say three to 4% royalty. If you have a patent application and that goes up if you have an issued patent. So if you have an issued patent, uh, now your royalty maybe goes up to like 5 or 6%. So you get more money for having uh, an issued patent. But again, a lot of times as a license, a licensor, that, that, a lot of times they don't even, or someone who's uh, giving you a license deal, they're not even going to give you that deal if you don't have your stuff protected. So I know a lot of times people don't want to bring it to market, such as based on like you did, you brought your stuff to market. Uh, but a lot of people don't want to do that. They just want to get a license a deal and kind of go from there. And you, you're you not even going to be able to get those license de licensing deals if you don't have your stuff protected. So that's it's, it's a lot of benefits for uh, kind of having IP and kind of your patents you know, in order for things. Uh, and, and so I guess another thing that I kind of wanted to mention on the IP side of things uh, just having a good attorney. I know we were talking offline on how your attorney provided some valuable insight, particularly what relates to the brush on the device, uh, I think just that's another uh, another aspect that is not appreciated is maybe having a good attorney and, you know, you know maybe you have to uh, kind of do a little bit of homework. Uh, I'm interviewing a, a gentleman later on in a week, and he, he had this device that he probably should have got a, a design patent on. I'm not sure, at least the earlier version, of the, how effective the utility patent was, but he got that and he started to see knockoffs and he wondered why he can't do anything with it where this attorney should have probably told him you need a design patent on this because that's going to have a lot more teeth with this particular item than what the utility patent is that 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 we got for you. So, yeah, I mean, I think, uh, yeah, just a, a patent attorney having a good one is uh, another thing that can't be uh, understated. And it seems like you had, you know, you got a pretty good attorney with gave you some valuable insight. Uh, as you were going through the process. Yeah, thankfully I got pretty lucky. Um, he's been able to kind of like 
guide me through a, a lot of these aspects that we're talking about right now and uh, kind of like distill it into like layman's terms so I can yeah. kind of follow through. Uh, but yeah, uh, I think we were talking about it like all the before our interview. Uh, yeah, that like, just the added benefit of having someone to kind of bounce ideas off of, like yeah. especially in the early stage, like they've seen what works and what does that. Yeah. A lot of very famous people um, are uh, come from like a patent side. Like, you know, there's there's obviously the elephant in the room, like Einstein was a patent like clerk. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. And so that probably helped him a lot with some ideas. Uh, but yeah, I think uh, uh, there's a lot of like tertiary kind of benefits to having a patent. For sure. Off. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So then I guess. Getting off into the Shark Tank experience, it seemed like you said the Kickstarter, you were able to kind of get in contact with some maybe some producers on, from Shark Tank based on you being on Kickstarter, which, again, is, is a pretty cool thing. <clears throat> now, going into it, and I kind of interviewed a number of contestants on Shark Tank, and I, I learned very early on that just because you do a deal or just because you pitch on Shark Tank doesn't necessarily mean that pitch is going to kind of make it to television, number one. But then number mm -hmm. two, just because you do a deal with the actual shark doesn't mean that that deal is going to close out. So on the show, you did a deal with Mark Cuban. Now, did that kind of make it to the finish line? Uh, or I, I guess how where does that deal stand with, with Mark Cuban? Because it seems like he was very interested not only in maybe the product, but just kind of your engineering mind and your design mind. So I guess how did kind of where, do, where does things stand at this point between uh, kind of the deal with you and Mark? Uh, right now, yeah, we're, I'm still working with them. We haven't yeah. fully signed the deal yet. Um, because actually my, my episode was taped like as one of the last ones. Um, but, uh, what is it? Yeah. I, uh, I've been working with their team and working with the, the lawyers and working with Mark Cuban himself. Like he's already reached out to me and, uh, we email each other. Yeah. It feels really weird to email Mark Cuban. Uh, I get really nervous to be honest, but <laughs> like. He's really, yeah, he's a really nice guy. And uh, what is it? He laughs at my jokes and stuff. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 so how did, because that's the other, it seems like the benefit of being on Shark Tank that kind of sales maybe go through the roof or really spike after uh, kind of being on the show or at least the show airing. Did you kind of witness that or experience that after the show? Yeah, definitely. Like the so called Shark Tank effect is very real. Um, I, uh, yeah, I, I I sold all all out of inventory, and right now I'm just nice. taking pre-orders. Oh. Um, yeah, but um, yeah, I, I didn't expect so much um, nice messages as well. Like so many people were like, you know, we loved you on Shark Tank, and uh, we love your product, and it was just really great to to get a lot of support. Um, so I'm super thankful for all the viewers. Nice, and, and I was going to say, uh. Man, this this bug catching advice, this thing, this is not like, okay, I have a spider and and, and therefore let me go kind of get the bug catching advice or a cup of bug to, to get it, man. This if you go on a website, this thing is man, I am seeing like bees and uh flies and heck, I'm even seeing lizards. So, you know, three, I think you said <laughs> on the website three inches or smaller is kind of what this thing is you know, probably best for it as it relates to lizards. And again, again, being in Michigan, you I guess maybe I didn't appreciate that because we don't have lizards, but if you're in Arizona and or in Florida or Texas, some of these warmer states that are warmer all year round, I would imagine that lizards being in the home is a is a bigger thing. Like I said, it's not a thing in Michigan. We don't have lizards, but that's probably because we have fall in the wintertime. Uh, so I didn't appreciate that, but it seems like this thing is, uh, it, man, it, it, it catches a variety of critters, of insects, not just you know, the spiders, which uh, what would you typically think? Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, lizards. Lizards are another beast. I didn't expect people to catch um, so many things with a uh, cup of bug. <clears throat> I just kind of designed it for smaller critters. Yeah. But the cup is big enough for some of the smaller lizards and geckos like in yeah. Florida. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, people people have caught some crazy stuff. There is a uh, in Hawaii, there's like a huntsman spider. I don't know if you're familiar with this one, David. Man. Did I see that on the website? It was like this giant. It looked like a tarantula. If I'm yeah. No, yeah, this thing, uh, Huntsman is like a tarantula, but like fast, crazy. Wow. Uh, if you watch videos, um, but yeah, I I've caught a, a Huntsman in California too, which was terrifying that they're actually in California. 
That, um, in, like in the home or was this the, the one that you caught mm -hmm. that outside? It was in the home. Yeah, I caught two. Um, yeah, it was it was up in the mountains. So, you know, hopefully you don't see it too often. But I was on a little retreat and like it was up in the Sequoia National Park okay. and we saw a huntsman there. And I was like, oh, my gosh, like that thing is scary. Um, but, I, I, uh, I just think about I don't even think about like I think about the fact that when I'm sleeping, this thing is possibly crawling. On me. That's that's the thing that I mean, I, you just pass out thinking about it. it's cool <laughs> if you have. A spider that's crawling on you and it's like okay whatever a lot of times you're probably going to brush it off if you're sleeping and you feel it but to have this big gigantic spider crawling on you maybe when you're sleeping is more terrifying than seeing it in person now at least to me as i think about it yeah um that's a terrifying thought uh yeah it, it definitely has some like kind of face hugger vibes from like alien predator <laughs> for sure uh, i think a home alone when you know they <laughs> oh, gosh. Kind of hit them in a uh, mara was hitting uh I think the character <laughs> joe pesci's character uh with like the crowbar because he had the spider uh crawling on him. Oh yeah, yeah, I remember that. Oh my gosh, yeah. There's there's a lot of uh, uh, Hollywood precedents to that one. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's inspired a lot of scene. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's pretty amazing what people have caught. And um, uh, yeah, just I guess never limit yourself or, or limit your product and be like, oh, no one's gonna buy this, you know? Because you never know. Like sometimes. There's like that one application that you never thought was useful and then people start using it and then commenting on it. And then that leads to like a redesign yep. to, to satisfy that one application. So, um, yeah, I just hope that people like never really talk themselves out of like an invention like they always do. And people just trying to give it a shot and kind of see where it goes. So, no, absolutely. Yeah. I, I, I would I would 100% agree with you on that one. And I think just a good segue from the reinvention and redesign and uh, you know, further embodiments, have you gotten any feedback or comments so far that kind of led you believe, okay, this is the next product? Because that was going to be the thing is, is it any new products that you have on the horizon, whether it's uh, you know, further embodiments based off the cup of bug or is it just kind of new inventions altogether? I know Mark, Mark Cuban seems to be excited to have you working on maybe some other different things that he's involved with. So I guess, is it any new products that you can talk about? At least again, I'm not, I don't want to start the clock going uh, from a pan perspective, but <laughs> is it uh, anything that you can kind of discuss as far as some new products that are in a pipeline? Um, yeah. I mean, there's been a lot of um, uh, people on social media, followers and, and customers as well. Um, like talking about getting a bigger cup of bug because, there's, um, you know, different, different kinds of like people want to catch maybe like mice or like snakes or like, um, yeah, some, some bigger stuff out there. Uh, I'm trying to think. Yeah. So I've been kind of like while working on this project, Cup of Bug, like thinking about um, other ways to increase the product line. Um, but at the same time, you know, I, I think with Mark Cuban or at least Cup of Bug right now. I, I definitely need to just focus on finishing out this project and not like jumping to something else really quick. Like we're trying to um, get this product to uh, a larger market. Like hopefully I can sell it more in the U S as well as get it global. Um, so that's my plan right now. And, and I was going to ask you about that from a global standpoint. And again, just as kind of pulling my patent attorney hat on and kind of building up the conversation we had earlier as it relates to protecting it overseas is this something that you did early on or did you just file for a patent in the U.S., uh, if that makes sense? Because a lot of times people file for a patent application only in the U.S. because that's kind of the bigger market. Uh, but as they have later thoughts to go globally in different countries, maybe in Europe or in Canada or just kind of different countries outside the U.S., a lot of times that one year or the time would have passed for them to be able to actually protect the invention in that foreign jurisdiction, at least by way of a patent. So have you had an opportunity to uh, maybe protect this thing overseas or maybe not not so much? Um, yeah, when I was doing the patent um, for the U.S., like my attorney asked me if I wanted to uh, get a patent also in like China and uh, Europe. But for me, I just kind of wanted to, you know, kind of, I guess, get my feet wet just in the U.S. Yeah. first and then... Maybe in a future product, I'll I'll do like Europe or, yeah, or sure. China. I didn't patent over there, even though, you know, I probably should have. 
but I don't know. No one's no one seems to be interested in copying Cup of Bug right now. <laughs> so I guess no, I'm all right. No, and yeah. I, and I understand, man. Uh, I mean, it's easy as a patent attorney to say, "Hey, get a patent here or there or here or there," but you know, unfortunately, it's a cost associated with this stuff, and we are dealing with mm-hmm. uh, trying to protect the invention overseas. Uh, the cost can kind of start to go up uh, pretty fast there. So that's, uh, I guess, just something to think about for the audience. So I, I guess maybe as we kind of end. Uh, start to kind of wrap up things just a few final questions uh what advice can you give aspiring entrepreneurs i know you kind of talked about a lot of nuggets and jewels that i think that the, the audience can take with them uh as they're you know hopefully get off and at some point get off into the entrepreneurial game uh but what advice would you give specifically to aspiring entrepreneurs and uh inventors um hmm. i think um what is it um I think the hardest part is just getting something out there. Mm. Uh, as like an inventor and entrepreneur, it 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 it, it is kind of like a lot of it putting like yourself, your like your neck out there, and you know there's a lot of failure. Like a lot of people kind of talk themselves out because there are statistics that say like what seventy percent of businesses fail within like five years or something like that. And yeah, that might be true, um, but at the same time, like failure isn't bad so to speak it's kind of a rite of passage for an entrepreneur and i've definitely failed i've had other businesses that have failed you know i've been fully banned on certain like amazon like i've had other accounts banned on amazon for other reasons but uh not ip related um but you know you're gonna run into a lot of roadblocks and entrepreneur really is about kind of like how you can get back up very few people have have um, made it out of entrepreneurship unscathed, so to speak. Um, so it is it is um, a test really of like endurance. Um, and uh, I hope people give themselves a shot, put something out there. Your first product is probably going to suck. Um, and it's probably going to be something that you look back in five years and be like, wow, I can't believe I released that. POS. Um, and uh, so, you know, you just have to kind of like think almost like um, in the future. Like, if I bring this out there, what's the worst that can happen? Yeah, I might fail. Yeah, it might be a little bit embarrassing. Uh, but, you know, it's going to be a great experience either way. And everyone think about the journey rather than the destination. That's how you're going to get over it. So I just hope that people get over that first hurdle and try it out and um, see entrepreneurship is for them i like that i like that definitely uh be one of perseverance I, I i definitely like that and then i guess the final kind of question or thought is how can people number one follow you i'm not sure if you're big on social media but then number two how can they purchase the cup of bug product oh uh, yeah thank you uh what is it um i have a uh, tiktok and instagram uh, my handle is cup of bug underscore official um and uh, our website, you can purchase on our website or on Amazon. Uh, if you go on Amazon, you just search up Cup of Bug. On the website, it's um, www.cupofbug.com. Um, no hyphens. Um, and yeah, uh, right now we're accepting free orders, but in May, hopefully we'll have uh, some stock still after the pre order so people can buy it there. Nice, 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 nice. Well, again, I, I appreciate you giving me a little bit of time here uh, this morning. Uh, audience, definitely go check out the product. Go follow Justin. He's doing some great things, not only with Cup of Bug, but I'm pretty sure he's going to have some amazing products uh, coming out later down the line. This is a person, I guess, as he talked about, he's not at the beginning stages of his entrepreneurial journey as it relates to kind of early products or beginning products. He's He's been through the process a number of times, so I would imagine that he's got a good feel for things and uh, – the products that he will come out with here and going forward will be quality products, will be uh, product, products that actually saw products that you can use in real life. And uh, so definitely go support him. Uh, we definitely look to have him back at some point later on, just kind of see what he's working on, because it seems like this is only the beginning, not the end uh, of what he's doing over there with his company. And uh, until next time, audience, take care. <laughs>